deep breath. I always have to remind myself when we can read it. 12, 20, 20. I'll need to remember that. All right, um, what we're going to do in the second half of class, lecture B, is go back and do some geometry again. So we're mixing up these applications, but we're seeing them over and over again. We're going to do one more volume problem. Then we're going to move on to doing arc length problems, which is really distance traveling. We're going to talk about parametric curves again. So these things come back again. I think it's better to see things more than once. Yeah. Is consistent with the Nickets lessons about retrieval practice and that kind of thing that you were quizzed on at the very beginning of the semester. All right, so uh, one more volume kind of problem. Actually, the problem I'm about to do is of a type we've already done, just as one, another example. I'm going to consider a region in the xy plane. Let's once again consider the region under the graph of y equals x squared from 0 to 2. But I'm not going to rotate it around the x-axis or some other axis this time. Instead, I'm going to imagine it being in a flat plane and constructing a solid by constructing cross-sections of the same type above this region. Think about it three-dimensionally. Imagine an x-axis kind of going to your right here, a y-axis kind of going into the board there, and say a z-axis going upward. Our region here, the shaded region, now you've got to think of three-dimensionally as lying in a plane that's kind of going into the board like this. This is two here, this is four here, by the way. Above this planar region, I am going to create equilateral triangles. For any given x whose base is this line which back in this picture would be this line right there. So above that line, I'm going to put an equilateral triangle, meaning the sides all have the same length and the angles are all 60 degrees. But as x gets bigger, these triangles get bigger because x squared is getting bigger. So different x's give you different size triangles Small x's give you small triangles. Large x's give you larger triangles. In so doing, I am creating a solid. And I'd like to know the volume of that solid. Solid looks something like this. Not too bad of a drawing. Okay. It's a solid of specified cross sections. I picked equilateral triangles. The example I did before, I picked squares. You can pick hemispheres, or excuse me, hem semicircles is what I meant to say. You can pick lots of different cross sections. The cross sections are equilateral triangles. What's the base and the height of those equilateral triangles? That's going to help me find my cross sectional area function that I integrate to find the volume. Because the area of a triangle is one half base times height. Both the base and the height depend on x. The base is x squared. Right? For any given x, the value of this distance here, which is x squared, because that's the equation of the curve, is the base of the triangle. What about the height? We're going to need a little Pythagorean theorem to help us find the height here. Think about your typical cross section and try to make your triangle look more equilateral. Okay, pretend that's an equilateral triangle. So these are all 60 degree angles here. Oops. 60 degree angles. Pretend that's equilateral. Okay. The base is that. Focus on one of these right triangles. Now, it's a 30, 60, 90 right triangle, and there are memorized relationships between the sides. But to tell you the truth, I always forget them. So I'm going to try to rederive the height using the Pythagorean theorem. 
this right triangle right there. This side is really the base over 2. The, the uh, hypotenuse is the base. What's the height? That's what we've got to find. Use the Pythagorean theorem. H of x squared. By the way, you don't have to put the x's in here like I'm doing, but I want to emphasize that these things do depend on what x is. Different x's give you different triangles. <clears throat> H of x squared plus b of x over 2 squared must equal the hypotenuse squared b of x squared. H of x must be the square root of, subtract this to both, for both sides. This is really b of x squared divided by 4. b of x squared divided by 4. So when I subtract that from both sides, I get a 3 fourths on the right side. It's going to be the square root of 3 fourths b of x squared Square root of 3 over 2, that seems familiar, times b of x, which is a positive quantity, so I don't need absolute value signs. That's the height. Now plug those things in to get the formula for a of x now. 1 half times b of x times h of x. Now plug in what b of x is. It's, it's x squared. square root of 3 over 2 times x squared here. b of x itself is x squared for this problem. For some other problem, it would be different. We get square root of 3 over 4, x to the fourth. That's the function we have to integrate to find the volume. Right? Imagine your hand is slicing the thin slices of infinitesimal thickness dv is always in these situations, a of x dx. The total volume is the sum of the little volumes, thinking intuitively like a physicist would, ultimately leading us to integrate from a to b, the cross-sectional area function. You don't have to go through this derivation every time, technically speaking, but I'm wanting you to, to rethink about it. For our situation, x goes from 0 to 2, we integrate square root of 3 over 4 times x to the 4th. This is going to give us square root of 3 over 20 x to the 5th. 2 to the 5th is 32. 32 over 20 is 16 tenths or 8 fifths. 8 is square root of 3 over 5 is what appears to be the answer. 32 over 20 is 16 over 10 is 8 over 5 times square root of 3. Square root of 3 is about 1.7. 8 times 1.7 is in the ballpark of 13 or 14. Divide by 5, you get something between 2 and 3 cubic units for the volume. Okay? Does this make sense? Can I clarify anything? Again, I, I could have said the cross sections are squares. I could have said they are semicircles. You'd have to use the formula for the area of a semicircle, which is of course related to the formula for the area of a circle. Help you find a of x in those cases. a of x would be what changes depending on the situation. So you have a few problems where we specify the nature of these cross sections. It won't be a volume, a solid revolution. It's a specified cross section. Well, a few problems like that over the weekend. Let's go back to uh, distance traveled now. Along parametric curves, and I'm also going to introduce in this context something new, polar coordinates. Though you technically should have seen polar coordinates in pre-calc at least, if not in calc 1. <clears throat> so recall with parametric equations, x is some function of time, y is some function of time. We can calculate the speed, which I typically do write as speed of t. 
Though the book writes more often as v of t, but don't think that's the velocity. And maybe to emphasize that it's not a velocity, if I write it as a v of t, I'll make it kind of a cursive v. That's not the velocity. It doesn't have a little half arrow above it. It's not a vector. It's the speed. You okay with that? Not velocity. Speed. How fast are you going? Not what direction are you moving as well. Can be found by doing the square root of f prime of t squared plus g prime of t squared. I want to also write that in Leibniz notation here. Um, as square root of dx dt squared plus dy dt squared. That would be how you could write it in Leibniz notation. And once again, thinking intuitively like a scientist would and not a mathematician, let's pretend these things are fractions. Leibniz notation for the derivative. Let's go ahead and pretend they're fractions, even though they're not. Pretending, maybe I should make an extra note for that. Pretending dx dt and dy dt are fractions, which many scientists go ahead and pretend. It's not rigorous math. We could write the speed as square root of, okay, this gets a little funny, dx squared plus dy squared over dt squared. You've probably never seen something like that before. Pretending like we're squaring the dx's and the dy's and the dt's, even though we're not. Okay, it's not reverse math, but it gets to the right answer. It's kind of like the justification for scientists. Oh, it gives me the right answer anyway. So why not worry about it? Which maybe we could write it like this. What's the square root of dt squared? I guess that's dt. And that's kind of funny looking too. Maybe we should give a name to the top. The name people commonly give is ds. So if you do that, if you call this thing ds, it turns out you commonly see the speed written as ds dt. What is s? Or what is ds might be the better question. S is a measure of arc length, distance traveled really. And ds is intuitively thought of as a small distance traveled, an infinitesimal distance traveled, in fact, over an infinitesimal time interval. And this is thought of as distance traveled divided by time elapsed. Into it. Even though it's not. And in fact, we, all, we know that the distance traveled, which if your motion is all in one direction, you're not backtracking, is the same as something called arc length. If there's no backtracking, which we're going to go ahead and assume, if no backtracking, no back and forth motion here, then these things are the same. The distance traveled along the curve is the same as the length of the curve. We're not going back and forth along the curve. We already know that that's the integral of the speed over the time interval. I'll go ahead and write the speed like this. This is from t equals a to t equals b. Though if we were after a distance traveled function, starting at time 0, we would let a equal 0 and b equal t. If I did dist of t, i do the integral from 0 to t, and I'd call the variable for the speed something else like tau. Okay. 
what's the distance traveled as a function of time from time zero to time t. You could think of this as a function. Here a and b are fixed, a not necessarily zero. Here a is taken to be zero and b is taken to be the variable, giving us a distance traveled function. That is an antiderivative of the speed. You, we've seen all this before, up here and down here. It's the red stuff we haven't seen before. Um, but with this red stuff on the board, you could think of this integral in another way. You could think of this as the integral of ds dt. And maybe intuitively you could cancel the dt's and say, equal sign with quotes maybe, you're really integrating ds. You're adding up the little arc lengths to find the total arc In a picture, what you can do is you can imagine you're moving along a parametric curve like this, and you're zooming in near any point you want so far that it looks straight. It's like you've got a microscope going super duper close so far that it looks straight. And in fact, you pretend that's an infinitesimal distance. The relationship between these infinitesimals is this. 